Faster my, and welcome to this week's agenda. I'm Phil Gorn, putting that passion back into politics. This week, I'm speaking to Douglas Councillor and Labour Party member Devon Watson. Devon is relatively new to politics, but has already created a reputation for his very clear and forthright views on Manx politics. In tonight's programme, Devon talks about inequality in Manx society being possibly the highest it's ever been, local democracy being trampled on, and the perilous global situation explained in the latest report by the Independent Panel on Climate Change, and much more. Devon Watson just uh, elected to Douglas Borough Council. Um, narrowly missed out becoming the leader of uh, Douglas Borough Council, uh, you're a bit of a political animal. Well, yeah, there are things that need to be done. I mean, we need to be building houses. We need a government that has a firm response to poverty. We need a government that emphasizes better infrastructure. Um, and uh, I'm fairly passionate about that. And uh, a lot of the people uh, I chat to are passionate about it too. So there's there's really no time to waste on a lot of these things. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you're, you're obviously uh, a young man. Uh, which is quite rare in politics, um, and you have quite strong and, and, and fairly strident uh, views on, on, on quite a lot of things. Um, do, do you think that sometimes uh, the the younger generation perhaps has been left behind with the way in which uh, policies uh, are generated, developed on the island? Yeah, I mean, in broad in broad schemes, I'd, I'd say yes. And, and I just talk about the example of, of my roommate. Like, So she is a healthcare worker. She was applauded during the pandemic. We all went outside of our houses and clapped for her. Um, she's doing some of the most difficult and sometimes the most uh, unsanitary work on the island. A really, really tough job. And she's barely earning uh, the living wage, right? Um, and uh, one of my other friends has just graduated with a big degree and she's working in pharmacy and she's earning £8.60 an hour with no benefits on a zero hours contract. Um, these are conditions of people barely scraping by, but these are people doing A, essential, some of the most important work in the country. Um, and a lot of these people are young um, and I'm, I'm the first person to come in with, with, with a fairly strident approach to politics here. But I'm not going to be the last, um, particularly as more of these folks become more politically engaged and, and active, because uh, the direction of things and the growing wealth inequality is less acceptable, especially since when we look at the broad broad track of things, people are committing less crime, people are working harder than they, than they ever have in the past, and very often at the end of the day, they're sharing, they're receiving a smaller share of what the economy produces than at any point in the past. I mean, this is perhaps the, the highest level of inequality we've had. But I don't think that it's a young versus old issue. I mean, I, I go and visit council houses of people in who are pensioners living in conditions of poverty themselves. So, I mean, I think it's an issue of, of working in middle class people, um, working harder to just make ends meet. And whilst the economy produces unbelievable levels of wealth. I mean, you, you, you talk about inequality it's still fair to say that the Isle of Man generally for most people uh, is a fantastic place to live and work and to be. Um, so surely, uh, whilst, yes, there is a, a, a significant difference between the wealthiest and the poorest person on the Isle of Man, uh, the poorest person on the Isle of Man still has a fairly good life. To an extent. I mean, yes, obviously the Isle of Man is an incredible place to live. I imagine that there's probably 60% of the population who do relatively well, although there's a, a broad middle class that is uh, struggling, particularly when it comes to in the children of the middle class trying to buy houses. But if we actually look at the numbers, um, life expectancy here, although the fact that our GDP per capita is double that of the UK, our life expectancy is lower. We've got one of the lowest ratios of, of, of GPs to um, patients in much of Europe. Um, one in six people um, earn less than the living wage. So you've got people working full-time jobs trapped in poverty simply because their jobs don't pay enough. Often these are people who are essential workers, people that we praised last year for maintaining things during the pandemic. One in seven households struggle with few poverty. They struggle to pay their heating bills um, every so often. Um, and I guess when you just look at the raw numbers of the number of people being left behind, um, uh, it's it's concerning. And I think that just because that a lot of people are doing well now, 
doesn't mean that we should be lured into a sense of, of complacency. So one of the core reasons I say this is if we look at wage data since 2008, what we see is that in broad sense, relative to cost, wages have stagnated for the economy overall. If you're a manual worker, wages have plummeted um, in real terms relative to costs of the Alaman. Um, but so you've got two main sources of, of getting things, really. You've got public services and you've got your wages. So we assume, OK, maybe wages have stayed relatively stagnant. But maybe public services have gotten better. But no, they haven't, right? So what we've seen is we've seen uh, a government that has uh, ended free uh, university tuition, that has not produced more council and social housing to accommodate demand. Um, care homes have been privatized to a large extent. We've shuttered state nurseries. Many places are now being cut off from public transport. So yes, a lot of people are doing well, but the direction of travel is particularly concerning. As a politician and uh, someone who who was aiming uh, to be the leader of Douglas Borough Council, uh, uh, presumably you've got some ideas as to how to fix these problems. Uh, For now, I'm definitely not aiming to be leader of Douglas Council. I think it's good that there was a competitive election. I think it's a tragedy that Manx democracy uh, an election came down to two South Africans. But hey, uh, at least uh, (laughs) at least as immigrants were integrating to some extent. but no, I mean, uh, in all seriousness, the, my, my job at the moment is to work with the current administration uh, and, and see how we can work together. I mean, there's 12 of us in there and we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to provide good services. But there are a number of solutions that, that are readily available. So, I mean, at least on a local level, we can ensure that all contractors are paid the living wage. We can sort of invest in local suppliers. We can, um, the biggest thing that we need to do is we need to build far more affordable housing. Um, and unfortunately, the DOI is a bit of a block in this one. The DOI refuses to even allow us to take out loans. Um, even though we have the ability to to sort of pay them back ourselves, we don't, we shouldn't need their permission. But presumably, there's a, a, a reason for that. I mean, DOI do tend to follow process um, and you know, the process is set out for them uh, by the law. So presumably there's some uh, some re- reason more than the DOI just don't, don't like Douglas Borough Council. Sure, I think, but it's also one of those where you, I'm sure they've got their own processes and I'm sure it's valid and I'm sure if I were to talk to them, they could maybe sort of make a very convincing case. But at the end of the day, um, a democratic body being frustrated by an unelected bureaucracy does raise questions as to the value of local democracy and the value of democracy more generally. We recently seen uh, a situation in which uh, a number of voters were prevented, um, and maybe thousands of people prevented from going to the polls in the last election, simply because the DOI did not create contingency plans to allow people who are isolating from COVID to go out and vote. This is a problem that was raised months ago, right? And, and, and this is still something that I remain frustrated about, that, that democracy was simply trampled on. And we need to improve our democratic systems. Um, and yes, there are problems with democracy. I mean, often we aren't experts, but if we can defer to, to experts on, on important matters, there's nothing that's wrong with democracy that can't be solved by what is right with democracy. And I suppose the, I mean, you, you, you raised there the unelected bureaucracy, which is the DOI, and yet... Uh, the DOI um, is, you know, staffed by, um, among others, uh, politicians who are elected by the people. So um, it's not entirely fair to say that it's an unelected bureaucracy. Perhaps the civil servants following the laws that have been passed by um, Tenwald, the, the processes that they're followed have been created by politicians. Would that yeah. not be fair? Yeah, I mean, to an extent that is fair. And I don't want this to ever come across as though a criticism of the workers in the DUI. I met many officers in the DUI and they're some of the most hardworking, intelligent people that I've met. I mean, they, they do an incredible job, a lot of them. Um, but I think that when we look at it in broad strokes, um, yes, we've got national level politicians who do create these rules. But then to an extent, there needs to be a bit of respect for local politics and, and, and a respect. So just because someone happens to be the minister of the DOI, that should not by default currently does mean that they have a veto power of the decision of every single local authority. Because yeah, thousands of people have come out to vote for people or to be appointed by people um, to, to sit in their local government uh, entities. And often these people have a much better idea of what's going on very close to the ground and they've got a much deeper contact with constituents. So I'm, I'm, I guess at this point I'm just sort of frustrated of uh, talking to residents and saying, sorry, we, we were having difficulty providing parking or the state of the roads or the state of pavements because uh, this is actually a DUI matter rather than a council matter. 
You're listening to the Douglas Councillor Devon Watson. I have sat on the other side of the table. I've been, uh, uh, well, actually, I've been a commissioner and an MHK, and I understand it from both both angles. Uh, but it is fair to say, back in uh, the, my last term as DOI minister, we had identified as an absolute key priority uh, a new housing bill to update the uh, somewhat decaying uh, policies and legislation that we had in place and I think we're still waiting for that housing bill uh, some five years later. The, the other thing uh, as well that uh, you, you raised there really is is perhaps this whole debate over uh, local and central government and how they work together and uh, I, I don't know, do you have a, a particular view as to, as to where things are going wrong, how they could be fixed? I mean, I think it's one of those where, I mean, I think a lot of people are happy with the services that are provided from local authorities. I mean, I think there are obviously exceptions. I mean, I think there is a a lot of content with regards to Douglas Council that does need to be addressed. Um, But I think there is, I I think there needs to be a role for for local democracy and we need to sort of look at the the appropriate measures. I think perhaps having 19 local authorities is, is, is excessive. So having 19 entities providing various local services means that there's some duplication of roles and duplications of tasks that themselves could be done more efficiently and provide better value for ratepayers if it were uh, combined together. But this has to be a process that's that's organic, I think. I think sort of imposing a world top-down is, is difficult. And I think we've seen a number of mergers from local authorities recently, a core example being Arbor and Russian, that have been quite successful. And I think people are relatively happy with that. Um, I also think that when we do merge authorities, you have a stronger possibility of having contested elections. So the biggest problem that we do have on local level is that a lot of people just aren't interested in in local government and local and, democracy. And, and, wh- and why do you think that is? Because because actually, you know, the, the the things that local government can do for you as a as a as a person listening to this program, a ratepayer, a taxpayer, uh, local government actually have a, a fairly significant influence on on quite a lot of things uh, in your life. So why do you think it is that people just don't seem switched on? Um, in terms of local politics, I mean, they are to a slightly greater extent with national politics, but not that much more. But certainly there is that difference. Uh, local government is even less well supported than uh, central government in, in terms of elections. I guess it's also because like sort of to an extent, local government does not uh, provide a platform for people to exp- express their political ambitions on a broader scale. So, I mean, I've spoken to a few people and, and sort of encouraged them to run for local government and they say, no, I'm going to run for MHK instead because local government is not important enough. Um, and then their manifesto policies are just things such as dealing with parks and yeah. dealing with um, dealing with housing, dealing with the sort of local amenities, dealing with waste collection. They provide a manifesto that is closer toward what a local government does than my manifesto, right? But I think it's also one of those in which local government is one of those things where uh, the media doesn't report on it as much. So, I mean, as much as I do have love for my friends in the media, there was almost no reporting on, on local authority elections because they were overshadowed by national elections. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff that does happen, um, but I think it's also one of those in which politicians in local government are essentially volunteer workers. So you aren't really paid for this. You get a few expenses each year, Um But essentially, you're unpaid, which means it is something that if you do have a job or you have kids, there is a significant barrier to getting involved. And and that might explain why 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 people wouldn't stand uh, in in local authority elections. But it doesn't really uh, it doesn't explain why 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 people don't turn out to vote. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I'm not 100 percent sure why people don't turn out to vote. I mean, I think to some extent, folks aren't aren't particularly inspired. The voting does happen. Um, on a Thursday um, between 8 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. I think even if we did have a a day where we made a bigger bigger fuss about this. So, I mean, I think the amount of... I mean, one of the reasons why I do think people in other jurisdictions turn out and vote is that there's a lot more coverage of it and there's a lot more coverage of what it means. I think a lot of people also aren't shown, taught what local government does. Obviously, the government shouldn't... The education department's responsibility isn't to teach everybody every aspect of everything. But I think uh, it's one of those where a lot of people just aren't aware of what the remits and responsibilities of of local authorities are. So they aren't quite sure what they're voting for and they just get a manifesto shoved through their door because it is... If if they're lucky, of course. If they're lucky, of course, yeah. Because, I mean, I think to a large extent, a lot of people have never been visited by a politician. I mean, in the last Douglas Douglas East, my council election, talking from experience, 
I mean, I've got maybe 7,000 people who, who live in my ward, uh, and I was maybe able to visit five, 600 of them. If I had visited each person, which means as politicians probably need to do a better job of engaging with their constituents on a, on a day-to-day basis and being more involved in their lives. And to be fair, with, with uh, the local authority elections, it was very difficult for members to get round because the elections were declared very, very late. And of course, with COVID as well, um, uh, certainly I know in your case, uh, you, you weren't able to go out because you had COVID. Um, and and of course, there's a whole load of people who would be nervous about uh, people calling around at their homes at a time when uh, COVID seemed to have uh, really uh, let rip across the Isle of Man's community. Yeah, I mean that's definitely something that I that I felt was that there was a bit of hesitancy, and I think COVID was the sort of shadow that hung over the election. I think it's also about getting people registered to vote. So the process of of getting folks registered in the very first place is 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 cumbersome so you fill out an online form that gets sent to the department and they send you back another form that you fill in and you put in a post box and hopefully you're registered to vote and you aren't really given much feedback on this one um and it's also time limited so if you don't do it enough in a, in a short enough period of time you aren't registered um there are easier online mechanisms uh, i think sort of a making it easier to vote b making people more educated and c increasing uh, safety precautions is is probably something we can do, particularly with regards to a pandemic. I mean, I guess we're also learning here and, and to give the folks administering elections their due. It's a very difficult task to handle and administer election in a pandemic. No one was trained for this. It's not in their job description. So it's, it's, it's hard work. One of the reasons I, I was keen to get you on the programme was uh, as a result of the International Panel on Climate Change's latest uh, report, and uh, your uh, quite, um, some might even say, melodramatic um, uh, response to that. What, what essentially what I did was I pointed out that um, there is very little point in a person in their 20s today um, investing in a pension fund um, if things uh, continue going the way they are. And yes, people say this is melodramatic, but the people who are saying this are people who've not read the IPCC report and, and haven't actually looked at the numbers, right? So just to give briefly give a bit of explanation here, but when we talk about degrees of change of climate change, people say, oh, one, two, three degrees warmer. What does this mean? Maybe I'll have a slightly warmer summer. No, I mean, it's completely changing the way that the, the planet's climate work. Yes, so, it's, a, it's an average uh, yeah, temperature rise. Yeah. And of course, averages are spread across yeah. uh, the, the whole of the globe. And uh, anyone who has been uh, following the, uh, the even even just the basic news these days, uh, you know the the Arctic is uh, w- is hitting record temperatures over thirty degrees in the Arctic, which uh, seeing, is worrying. Yeah, we're seeing temperatures of of thirty three degrees in in the Arctic Circle, right? And um, we're also seeing temperatures of almost fifty degrees centigrade in Canada. Um, we're having towns engulfed. We have climate refugees in the first world. So let me explain why I, I think it's a bit sort of concerning to sort of think of sort of long t- uh, a- assets that have got a long term yield. So by the time I retire or a person in their 20s today retires, it's probably going to be 20, 2070, maybe 2080 with the, the way the uh, pension age and uh, what's left in the pension part is going. But it, it's one of those in which if we continue with the track we're doing, we're looking at a world that could very easily be 4.3, 4.5 degrees warmer at this point. So 4.5 degrees colder puts us in the range in which much of Britain was under ice caps. So 4.5 degrees warmer is uh, a world in which a lot of global agriculture has broken down. It's one in which many cities no longer uh, exist either from sweltering heat waves or or floods or from uh, climate-related disasters. So to go into a bit of technicalities here, when we look at at 35 degrees at 100% humidity, the human body can no longer give off heat through perspiration or sweating, which means as though temperatures at that level, at that level of humidity, are one in which people start to die from, from, from heat exhaustion. And these temperatures on a widespread scale used to be very, very rare. And now they're cropping up in places like Pakistan and India, 
And in a world that is 4.3 degrees warmer, they become the norm in summers in many parts of the world, in parts of the world that are projected to have two to three to four billion people. People never may just die when put in these conditions. They're going to move. And where they're going to move is they're going to move to Europe and they're going to move up north. Um, and yes, while I do feel like we've got an obligation to, to host refugees, one million Syrian refugees sort of destabilized European politics in a very serious way and led to some very serious political outcomes. What will 20 million, 30 million, 500 million, a billion refugees, what sort of impact will this have on how politics is conducted? When a lot of agriculture breaks down, is this an environment in which pension funds will continue to pay out for myself or my kids? And the answer is likely no, because our financial system is actually rather brittle. I mean, a dip in housing prices in the United States almost destroyed the global economy in 2008. And we're looking at a scale of danger by the end of the century that's, that's projected in, in the range of $600 trillion, $600 trillion. Now, this is a number that's almost incomprehensible um, in terms of total damage. But we're already seeing places like Florida that are sinking. You're listening to Douglas Councillor Devin Watson. I mean, th- 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 there'll be many people who listen to Manx Radio, they'll be live on the Isle of Man who will say, well, this is just uh, scaremongering. You know, you're, you're looking for the, the very worst possible outcomes, finding them and then uh, broadcasting just the, the, the negative stuff. And uh, actually, perhaps there's, there's some positives as well associated yeah. with this. Obviously, I, I read things like the IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change Reports, and I know that there are scientists who have spent a lot of time studying this and seem to have quite a lot of facts backing up their case. But how would you respond to those people who, who suggest that this is all some kind of uh, UN conspiracy to allow uh, experts in climate change just to have more funding for, for their particular areas of interest? I mean, well, I mean, I guess you can respond to that argument by pointing out that the people who make the most money are people who are paid by the fossil fuel industry. There is no money to be made in climate science. There's no money to be made in local politics. If you want to make money, you do what, what some climate scientists have done and have taken money from the fossil fuel industry and and uh, and just say that everything is fine. So there's a very well-coordinated propaganda campaign to try and um, limit the damage uh, or limit the sort of um, unrefutable science because that's essentially what the IPCC report is. So they've got the vast, vast, vast majority of scientists completely convinced right and we accept science when we go and turn on our computers when we go to the hospital we accept the scientific advice of doctors when you turn on your car you accept the the scientific advice of the engineers who made it and it's ironic to live in the modern world and also just decry science because one of its outcomes is is sort of uh, inconvenient to some extent it's it's hypocritical but I guess it's one of those where when we'd say, am I looking at the worst case scenario? Is that what I'm saying? No. I mean, this is pretty a middle of the road scenario. Best case scenario is by the end of this decade, we hit 1.5 degrees, at which stage things are still pretty catastrophic. We're already seeing horrifying consequences of climate change right now. So places like California um, are rocked by insane wildfires that are making large parts of the state uninhabitable. Large parts of Australia are completely devastated. And if that was a third world nation, it would massively struggle. We see people already being displaced by by droughts and famines that are one in a thousand year events. So in my home country of South Africa, we saw Cape Town hit three one in 600 year events in a row that caused it to be one of the first cities in the world to run out of water. So There were even plans uh, implemented a few years ago that would have seen the army distributing water, 25 litres per person. Um, So we're already seeing these effects, and this is at 0.5 to 1 degree warming, right? So um, the worst case scenario is about 5 or 6 degrees. Um, And this is a scenario that is pretty much these palm trees at the poles. Um, It's a world in which, which, which Spain is a desert, and this is just the science. These are just the facts. This is uncomfortable to hear, and the first instinct a lot of people have is to reject this information. Um, this is not popular thing to say because it's one of the things that people will get really, really angry at you for saying. But um, it's something that has to be said, and I encourage people to read these reports because, it, unfortunately, it's it's just the facts. The, the skeptics, and, and, and there are still plenty on, on the island, I think, 
uh, the, the skeptics would say, well, even if the worst does come to the worst, uh, the result for the Isle of Man is is going to be a win anyway, because it'll just mean we'll be a, 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 a much warmer uh, place to live. Um, but perhaps that's uh, missing some of the the other likely impacts um, in other parts of the world. I mean, you've mentioned uh, climate refugees, but uh, the other uh, perhaps worrying thing, and perhaps this is one of the most worrying elements from the IPCC report, particularly for the likes of the Isle of Man, is um, how concerned scientists are at the fact that ice seems to be melting significantly faster than uh, even some of their worst predictions had uh, had been. Yeah, because we're about a foot or so warmer than we were. I mean, we're, we're, sea levels are higher than they were pre-industrial times. This is a fact. You can measure this. You can see it from space. Um, so sea levels are higher than they were. And this is why hurricanes and severe events, one of the reasons, along with heat, are getting worse. It's a fact, right? I mean, we know that sea levels are higher. Um, but it's one of those in which the effects are not linear, so they don't scale in a, in a straightforward fashion. Um, the more ice it melts, the faster the process of melting grows. So there's a thing known as the albedo effect, in which white surfaces reflect light back into space. So a little bit of ice melts, there's less white area to reflect light, so more sunlight comes, which makes more melt, and the process is a, a feedback loop. And it's a feedback loop that gets faster over time. And yeah, we will probably see by the end of the century, unless things massively change, places like Ramsey are going to be in, in significant danger. Places like Laxey are going to be in danger. Places like Douglas are going to be in danger. Um, and it's far cheaper for us to work collectively to find a solution to this than it is to completely uproot our infrastructure um, and, and move off. But to go back to the sort of earlier claim that things will get better here, I mean, the world doesn't extend from, from the point of air to, to the calf sound because everything we consume from from the cars we drive to to the leather in our shoes to the food in our fridges it comes from an international global supply chain and a lot of these things can't be produced on the alamo and just given our labor pool and and the places that produce our stuff india and china large emitters themselves produce less than us per person but they are places that are going to be very heavily hard hit by this and the global financial system that the Alamans' prosperity relies on is something that isn't currently built to sustain and cope with a, a massive disruption in Earth's climate. Fascinating insight. Um, uh, effectively, what you're saying is, apart from housing, climate change, pensions, uh, tuition fees, and, and a whole range of other things, uh, the Alaman government has been doing a reasonable job for young people. Um, and um, yeah, I, I suppose it's it's it is a scary time, uh, particularly for younger generations. I mean, the, I think many people in in, in sort of uh, my age and over uh, are thinking that actually this isn't going to have that big an impact on us. Um, but then you look at uh, what's happened in Greece, and then not that far away in Turkey, uh, Greece with these amazing wildfires, and uh, Turkey with um, streets f- filled with mud and cars from flash f- uh, flooding. Um, so, so it's happening now. It's it's a serious issue, and uh, I'm guessing. Uh, Devon, that you're going to be around for for some years to come and hopefully developing ideas and policies to to address some of these issues. Let's hope. I think it's also one of those where I think our our solutions shouldn't only be built around ending climate change, which is something that we have to do. We have to, because at this point is we can't say it's going to happen anyway, therefore we should do nothing. It's like a car that's going to crash into a wall and we have to make a choice. Does this car crash in the wall at 30 miles an hour or does it crash into a wall at 200 miles an hour and, and i suppose the other element is do we actually introduce safety features to to to, to reduce the impact of the cash uh, yeah. of the crash as well which uh, i think some people miss out you know there is mitigation which is trying to reduce the overall uh, scale of climate change but there's adaptation as well which yeah. uh, we seem uh, perhaps a bit lacking on on, on the island I mean, yeah, if we look in terms of like whatever happens in the rest of the world, if we have our own energy supply, which can be provided by renewables, and a lot of these options are not completely unaffordable, um, then if we can guarantee our own energy supply, guarantee at least if worse comes to worse, um, an agricultural system that can feed everyone on the Alaman, we can guarantee that people have decent access to education and housing, it means that we're going to be well equipped in the future 
build up a base of skills, build up a base of resources and, and build up a series of capabilities that, that sort of ensure that regardless of what happens, people have the necessities they need to live. Uh, maybe the future is grim, but maybe it's also one in which we don't have to necessarily have conditions of poverty for many people. And and having um, a whole load of primarily independent politicians in our political system, um, is there any real hope that uh, we're, we're actually collectively going to be able to come together and address uh, in a very progressive way some of these, these really thorny and difficult issues? Um, I mean, I think some of the best politicians we do have in the Isle of Man, obviously I'm a party man myself, but I, I do think many of our best politicians are, are independents. I mean, obviously I'm not going to mention all of them specifically, but I mean, we've got some incredible uh, politicians, but I think it's problems of coordination. And I think that anyone who's been in politics for, for a while knows that there is a, to some extent, like a sort of coordinated club that does make a, 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 a quite a few decisions. But I think if, if people can coordinate in opposition and sort of create an agenda that's in line with the needs of most people in the Alaman, people can do really, really well. Well, I, I've certainly enjoyed that. It's fascinating to, to hear some, some of your views and your insights. I'm sure we'll, we'll want to get you back again in, in, on future programmes. Gurumai Moyu, uh, thanks very much for, for, for coming in on the show. Cheers. Thank you. That was Devon Watson. I hope you were taking notes. Devon comes from a generation underrepresented in and perhaps left behind by Manx politics, but speaks for everyone. That's all from Agenda this week. Please write to agenda at manxradio.com if you agree or disagree with any of the comments on this week's agenda. Or if you'd like me to add anything to your future agenda. You can listen again to this discussion on Manx Radio's website and on Spotify. But for now, Guramayu, thanks for listening. (laughs) 